good evening, Thief River Falls. Yes, indeed. The Tuesday Night Experiment is back and on the air for another great two hours of fun and fantastic interviews. I'm your host, Glenn Broggett, and I got a few other guys with me, too. Here to deliver another great edition of the show here on Pioneer 90.1 FM, RadioNorthland.org. Two big interview guests tonight in hour number one. I have Greg Prado, or Prado, it's Potato Potato. But Greg Prado, he's a great author. He wrote two books, uh, one about former Kiss drummer Eric Carr, a guy who passed away uh, rather young back in 1991 of a rare form of cancer, heart cancer. So he's coming on tonight. He's also written a book on MTV Ruled the World, the early years of music video. They're covering the early years of MTV. Hour number two, Greg Fitzsimmons, great comedian. Just wrote a great book, too, called Dear Mrs. Fitzsimmons. That's coming up. But now I got to get into introducing the two guys who show up each and every edition of the show, and I really appreciate the fact that they do. Yes, it's the crew of the Tuesday Night Experiment. First of all, Mr. Blind Dog. What's yeah. up, my friend? What's going on, brother? Well, not too much. Uh, boy, oh, boy. We're still reeling from the uh, lack of uh, NFL game last night. Oh, man. I already voiced my opinion on the AM side of the radio. So, it, uh, yeah, that kind of bummed me out. And I, I went on the Internet, went to the Herald website, checked out that article, that sports article, and uh, that Jim Shaw, the head honcho at Fox TV out of Fargo, which covers up here in Thief River Falls, blah. Yeah. Their license to carry Fox Sports is to North Dakota, not to Minnesota. So they were going to let all the Fox affiliates in North Dakota and New York, or Minnesota and New York, cover that Vikings game. But being that they're crossed away there in North Dakota, they couldn't do it. So, you know. Disappointing. Totally got shafted. Even went on the internet to try to watch the stream from uh, KMSP or whatever. Uh, just not, not, not rocking. Not rocking. They cut it off, man. They just put their little uh, screensaver logo on there. Oh Fox yeah, they, Nine. Do, they do that sometimes to block it out. They yeah. could have just showed a rerun of Perfect Strangers or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. So that yep. was my. So you were on your soapbox, man. Raving, yeah. man. I, I was genuinely frustrated, and I feel your pain, man. Yeah. But boy, was it—you know—in the end, was it really worth it? Though they kind of stank, they kind of stank the rink up there, up there in Detroit, twenty-one-three. Oh, psh. I think for it's, sure. I think the writing's on the wall for uh, Tavares Jackson uh, as being a starting quarterback in the uh, National Football League. Now they're looking at that uh, Minnesota Gopher Stadium. Oh yeah, TCF. the outdoor one. Yeah, TCF Field. That should. Be, you know what? I think that would be the right stuff. That that's perfect. It's that a, would be hardcore. It's a brand for how new, cold it is. Brand new stadium, basically. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about uh, dead of winter up for football outdoors. That's the old days. That's like at the Met, man. When back when men yeah. were men, and people go out to those games and froze. Not the Metrodome. Yo, dress up for the stuff. Not the Metrodome with its quilted uh, roof. I think they'll be playing outdoors on Monday. What is that, Monday against uh, Chicago. Chicago? Yeah, Leslie uh, Frazier's uh, former team, the team he played for in the, the, his glory days of the you yeah. know, the Super Bowl shuffle and all that stuff. So uh, so what if they have to pump out that antifreeze out of the the lines in there? Well worth, you know, well worth it. Come on, who's going to use the bathrooms anyway? And you know what, I think that actually has, <laughs> outdoors actually has more seating. Yeah. I mean, the Metrodome, what did we get? Maybe 50, 50,000? I think it was about 50,000 in there. Yeah. Uh, a little bit more with uh, baseball. But yeah. Yeah. I think that'd be a good thing. I, don't I, know. I just can't believe that tarp ripped. Yeah. Watching that, I think everybody up in here, these parts have, have seen the video of that uh, early morning debacle. Why would Fox Sports have their cameras recording and running? Uh, so early, unless they want to get the crowd filling up the dome and then whatever. Al Qaeda. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big conspiracy. I think they did it on purpose so they can just get a new dome right here in Minnesota. I think what it's do you think? I think it's high time. That dome's almost 30 years old. Outdated architecture. I think yeah, it's time the, to get open air. That oh. one guy in local TV here on the television station, he was doing that little interview and he said it's the ghetto of domes in the NFL. Well, it's it's so <laughs> ancient. You know, and I think the I think retractable roof would be where the big money's at. I mean, play a little open air, and then if it gets too cold or whatnot, close that baby up. Bathrooms are a little weird. I mean, it's like you're going to the trough to take a squirt. You know, 
Oh, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> a big welcome to the blind dog. And yeah. we forgot about the third piece here. A guy who later on, when he does his DVD review, I've got many words to say that may not be, let's just say, terrestrial radio friendly. But I'm going to welcome him anyway because he is a true dandy, a one and only, Mr. Sugar Sean. Well, well, well. You've got your music here. Hold on. Welcome to the show, buddy. All right. I kind of had a feeling we were going to uh, a theme here, you know. You got freaking Tiny Tim playing Tiptoe Through the Tulips. I mean, I thought you'd play something cool like Motorhead or something, Ace of Spades or something, but no. <laughs> Tiny Tim. And yes, I, uh, for, for all you people watching on YouTube here, No I am, Lemmy for you, buddy. I am taping part you of this do, sequence. You anyway. do not get rewarded for missing and not doing something, but we'll get into well, it in the I, second well, hour. Yeah, well, you know, we'll talk about that in the second hour. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'm apologizing ahead of time, but uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> So how's everybody doing? We're talking about the Metrodome. Well, first family. of all, buddy Jack, how are you? I'm I'm doing great. You know, just uh, working ready for the day. holidays, brother. Getting ready for holidays. Worked at Hugo's today. You know, just all. You know. Uh oh. Uh oh. Pander. Shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, there it is again. I'm gonna start keeping track, man. All right, all right that's all right. one. One so far. That's <laughs> There'll probably be many more tonight. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm the can panda you, bear. Can you hook me up with a roll of those Hugo's paid stickers? <laughs> but, 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 but I do want to let everybody know, you know, just for the ones who care anyway, that, uh, you know, I brought my ca- little handy-dandy camera here, you know, that we're filming some of the segments tonight here that we shoot on the air here. And you know, he's got tight shots like the guys who work for Scorsese. <laughs> well, I don't know. We can work with it. This flip cam has been pretty great for me for the last two years. So it's been very good to try to do to more on location stuff for my YouTube channel. Has so. that flip cam seen female nudity? Uh, well, come on, man, be not, honest. Not really, no. <laughs> we have that Tiny Tim ending there, so you can you can fess up. <laughs> if you want to believe that's what I've seen, then okay. If you want to believe that's what I've seen, you're gonna break into a song. <laughs> that's right. Then already, I done sure already reckon been then, around. Ace Ventura would say, yeah. <laughs> oh, but it's very uh, wonderful to have you there. Yeah, Sugar yeah. Sean. You know, I I, I try to uh, have a same same amount of time for an intro as a blind dog here. So I was worried, man. I was worried about the show. It could have been a sugar free show. I didn't know if you were coming sugar there. free. Yeah, for all the diabetics out there that listen to this show. That's what show. diabetics What's in that glass <laughs> over there. This one. Yeah, are you it's, whooping uh, up your own Coca-Cola jungle juice and, here? and uh, tequila. I think he burned his drink there. I can <laughs> ah, smell, Can- yeah. I can smell Canadian club over oh. here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I might have seen you at the liquor store. Earlier. Yeah, it's sneaking oh. around. <laughs> you, had, you had got carded, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, well, they thought, you know, because of my cute boy. You're too looks, cute you know. to look a minute over 17. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, they didn't know I'm 27, but, you know. They You're 27? I, <laughs> I didn't even know that. <laughs> well, now you know. You look like the, 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 the guy that walk in there and say, I want a case of pounders. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the buyer. <laughs> yes, I would like I would like some of the beer, please. No, if I ever. What kind? What do you got? If I Where's were, that night train? If I were to. No, 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 no. See, if I would ever buy for somebody, say, if I was underage, I should probably be saying this. Well, but, yeah, what the you, you, yeah, but, you keep it on the down. I, I, though, I, I would, I would do it exactly like on Teen Wolf, that kind of way. Even though you could turn into a werewolf, you can't, but you, you know, can't grow facial hair at the drop of a hat. Well, no, no, <laughs> you're, no, no, you're 27. You got little I think my bits ears there. make up for that. Is that flesh anyway. colored beard you got there, buddy? <laughs> Spencer Pratt Jeez. over there, paste it on. Wow, <laughs> takes it from his back. <laughs> Everyone knows the way to get liquor in there. Age. Come yeah, on now, you, do you it just this, hang you, out in front of the store. If you do it the way they did on Teen Wolf, then it's all it's I all want good. A keg of beer. Well, not well, you know. <laughs> and then how his buddy Styles tried to, beforehand. Well, we don't have a Wolfmobile so. and we don't have a Teen Wolf, so I guess we're S to the O to the L. Do we got on the that. Be, Do we got the Beast Boys is. or whatever <laughs> surfing US? <laughs> Uh, we're not playing uh, that. Take that oh, flip cam and... Yeah, we'll put it somewhere delightful. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got some uh, news out the shoot here, and it uh, concerns Sugar Sean's uh, <laughs> pinup to end all pinups. Oh, boy. Oh, yes. It's talking about Miley Cyrus. Yeah, and she just had a birthday not too long ago. Yep. And Billy Ray Cyrus took to his Twitter to issue a statement regarding the video of 18-year-old Miley taking a bong hit that leaked on the Internet December 10th. Here's what uh, BRC had to say about this. I have no idea. Just saw this stuff for the first time myself. I'm so sad. There's much. This is much, there's much beyond my control right now. 
I reckon, maybe, could they have tagged that? <laughs> Billy Ray is obviously referring to his daughter's recent headline-making behavior. Prior to the leaked video of Miley smoking salvia at her L.A. home on November 28th, the pop starlet endured a nude picture scandal. The trip and video was stolen off of her friend's camera while the pictures leaked after Miley's purse were uh, reportedly stolen. Oh, yeah. Uh, cle- just conveniently stolen, huh? Oh, well, yeah. you know, Miley's do. She could be smoking crack like her dad did back in the day. Well, yeah. You know, I wouldn't that, have doubt. To wear that dead where animal on his head. learn how to do that? Come on now. But, you know, Billy Ray is currently going through a divorce proceedings with Miley's mom, Tish. It says, it says Trish. All over Tish. crack cocaine. That's what it's all about. Billy Ray seems to hint that the divorce may be having an effect on Miley in, in his tweet. Yeah, he's got to go to Twitter <laughs> to talk about the deepest, darkest emotional So, links. Billy Ray, listen to me, buddy. Let me tell you how it is. <laughs> Listen to, the, listen you know, to the dog here. Listen so to the what dog, if, brother. So, so what if your wife is dipping in your stash of a plethora of cocaine? She gets all whapped up and goes after Brett Michaels. Night out of town after Brett Michaels. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But you know what? There's other Jacks people. up the credit card. Other people have chimed in. A reformed rock wildman Steven Tyler has reached out to Miley following her bong smoking scandal, urging the teenager to call him. If she needs advice on the pratfalls of fame, what are you talking? She wants. How about we play a little Miley underneath there? <laughs> yeah. Why not? Hey, you know. <laughs> my up in the air. The 18 year old Hannah. Ma- <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Load up the bong. Uh, at the, yeah. yeah. The 18 year old uh, Hannah Montana star, you know, sparked outrage, like I mentioned before. But uh, according to uh, Stephen T- uh, to TMZ here, anti-drug campaigners blasted the star for sending the wrong message to her young fans. And now Aerosmith frontman Tyler, who successfully conquered his drug demons, has offered Cyrus his help, even though he has no idea what Salvia is. <laughs> I don't know what it is. <laughs> is it short for saliva? <laughs> Why would it be short for saliva when it's the same know. words? In it? Smoke know. enough of it makes you drool. I've buddy. never done this stuff, so I don't know. <laughs> he says, I don't know what it is. I've never heard of it. If Miley is smoking that, tell her to call me. Is that legal in the state of Minnesota, Salvia? It, it's still legal in Minnesota, I think. North Dakota tried to ditch it now. Uh, many states are making that Salvia illegal to purchase. Well, and they have it in different grades, too. They uh, okay. uh, Different potencies of it. And if you go to YouTube and just type in Selvia, you get to watch a bunch of people just weird out on it. It it is. Uh, is it a hallucinogenic heavy, it's, thing? It's a hallucinogen. It? It's like you get torn from reality, and uh, a lot of people say you see it, you know, the creator or whatever. But mm. I I don't know. That's just what I gather. So it's like uh, the, the the smoke form of Jesus juice. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, I think it it got its popular. Uh, Popularity from uh, down in Mexico, they use it as a spiritual type, uh, as natives did with peyote and okay. uh, whatnot. But serious, man, it, it'll it'll mess you up. Well, here we got another person chiming in about this: celebrity drug counselor, Dr. Drew Pinsky. Oh, Dr. Drew knows. Oh, yes. <laughs> Word up! I love celebrity rehab. This new season is good. We'll get into that, but, but let's talk about this first. Uh, Dr. Drew has uh, urged Miley to seek professional help following her bond smoke, bong smoking scandal, pardon me, insisting she's acting out following the breakdown of her parents' marriage. Okay, he tells Access Hollywood, we know that she's going to be acting out now because her family's in trouble, so it's not unusual to see depression manifesting as various kinds of acting out behaviors. Adolescents don't get depressed the way adults do. They don't get sad and cry and withdraw. They often act out and become irritable. They act out with drugs and get in trouble, and she seems to be suffering. If I had a child that was doing that, or if I was advising a parent, I would say get professional help immediately. This cat is out of the bag. This is a child who is in trouble and who is suffering, and this is her way of trying to manage that. Get professional help. So Dr. Drew Pinsky chiming in on this thing. I, you Dr. Know, Drew. I love celebrity rehab so far this season. Leif Garrett, Janice Dickinson, Rachel Yucatel, that rich kid, that uh, billionaire uh, uh, Davis. <laughs> Excuse me, dry throat there. They are the, that Davis kid and Janice Dickinson just love getting on each other's nerves. Wow, I do recommend. So, I... what do you got? Are, are they in rehab for like pills? Are they hooked on pills or what? A majority of them. Uh, Leif Garrett, I think, has uh, had a long-standing problem with heroin. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 
He's chasing the dragon. Yeah, same with that Davis kid. I think Eric Roberts, the actor, Julia's older brother, yeah. is in there. Uh, he, he's got a pot problem. That's what he said. Of course, he's had a lot of problems with drugs in the past. That he yeah. says he's, he's, he's licked. Well, they're just worried he's going to go on to smoking crack. Yeah, and then <laughs> Keisha Cole's mom. Keisha Cole's a R&B singer. She has a reality show, I okay, think, yeah, yeah. on Centric uh, Television. Was well, her- she on Martin? No, I'm just- that's, that's Tisha Campbell. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's Martin. Tisha. He's uh, so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I have the first four seasons of DVD, believe it or not. What? I'm Martin? still missing season five, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. That's a good show. I love that show. Oh, man. Uh, Slausalito loves his Martin. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got some bad news. I got just some terrible news. Uh, former porn star John Leslie has died at the age of 65 after reportedly suffering a heart attack. Yeah, I know. I'll tell you more. The actor and director passed away last Sunday at his home in Mill Valley, California, according to his pal Mark Kearns, editor of adult film magazine AVN. Leslie, real name John Nuzzo, began his career in the pornogra- pornography industry in the 1970s and starred in explicit films including Cry for Cindy and Talk Dirty to Me which catapulted him to fame in 1980. He became one of the first adult actors to make the transition into directing. See, he was a modern-day porno renaissance man, according to Kearns, and landed numerous awards for his work, including his induction into the Legends of Erotica Hall of Fame in Las Vegas. Oh, wow. I'm going to miss that guy. Yeah, really, um, he, he was a, really uh, an icon, I tell you. Hold on. Let Hulk tell us some more. <laughs> oh yes we will <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute wait a minute <laughs> oh I love the boot man I tell you I'm pretty sure he's gonna bump into John Holmes up there we'll bring John Leslie back again yeah Hey, John, how's it going, man? Yeah, he is survived by his wife, Kathleen, his wife of 23 years. 23 years? <laughs> nice. He, he was cheating on her the whole time with all these porn videos. No, before. it's not cheating. He's just working, man. Yeah, he's bringing home the bacon. Yeah, that's right. No pun intended there. What a sick puppy you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. I wish you were here. Hey, it's Tuesday night. We're having a good time. This is the Tuesday night experiment here. It's 19 minutes after 7. You know, we got... I, I go to work just because of the fluffer girls. <laughs> that's, that's the true meaning why I like this job. You know what really hurts? <laughs> it's right around the holiday season. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what are they going to do? They're gonna, a couple of his close friends just gather around Christmas Eve and watch films and reminisce. <laughs> and hope- you know, I, I, I remember that day we are shooting there on the set. <laughs> Those were the days when we did it in old hotel rooms. Yeah. Just hope that one girl, she said she had a kicker in her neck for a week. <laughs> John Leslie, you'll be missed, brother. And just, yeah. hope, just hope Rick and Mortis doesn't set it. Anyway, yeah. I'll let you be creative on that oh, one. Oh, man. Another <laughs> Hulkster done gone to heaven. Oh. Nah, I mean, in his honor, I'm going to go home and watch Orgasmal. <laughs> a great film. Yeah. A great, that great is film. awesome. Well, guys, uh, should we get into some tunes? We got uh, the Paper Tongues on the way, as well as the latest from the Stone Temple Pilots. This is the Tuesday Night Experiment, boy. Yeah. With cinnamon. It sounds awfully cheery. Way <laughs> too happy. Way too happy. A uh, quick reminder about next week's show. I just got the, the con firm about an hour ago. I will be interviewing uh, Mr. Weiland's former wife, Mary Forsberg Weiland, who just put out a book here uh, last Tuesday called Fall to Pieces, about her life, uh, both her life and her life being married to the rocker from the Stunt Double Pilots and Velvet Revolver. So that's going to be next week on the Tuesday Night Experiment. So uh, that'll be kind of fun. Nice. You know, and uh, she definitely has gone through a lot of lot of stuff uh, with substances and depression and all of that. And we kind of get to hear her journey and, and where she's at in life right now. And I wonder if she uh, kind of did the whole Wyland lifestyle thing herself. Well, you think so? I, I think that there was a lot of problems. They were pretty toxic for each other, that sort of thing, and uh, yeah. that that should be uh, some interesting stuff. Mary Forsberg Weiland, you have to talk about her her uh, her new book, her her memoir, Fall to Pieces. That's coming up on next week's Pick edition. Pick up the pieces. Yeah, uh, you know, fall to pieces. Uh, you know, of course, the the Velvet Revolver tune. 
which was a pretty cool track back in. Oh yeah, 04. yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, really like the it's slash back to me now. Slash's guitar on that too. And uh, coming up, uh, hopefully here in a matter of minutes, I uh, have our first uh, guest of the hour or the show rather this week, Greg Prado. He's got two fantastic books. One uh, documenting the history of uh, the early years of MTV, called MTV Ruled the World: The Early Years of Music Video. And also a, a book that I was just last week, uh, I was, this was called to my attention, about the life of former Kiss drummer Eric Carr. Eric Carr was, uh, of course, the drummer who replaced Peter Chris in 1980. Oh, okay. Right after the making of the Unmasked album. And he had a lot of years, you know, with the band and then uh, with the makeup, rather. And then uh, he was with them uh, through the 80s when they took the makeup off. And uh, he passed away in 1991. I can't believe next year in August will be the 20th anniversary uh, of the death of Eric Carr. Wow. Probably, probably one of the more fan friendly members of the group too. It was just an unfortunate thing, uh, his 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 untimely passing. So we're going to talk uh, hopefully about that. Hopefully he'll call in. If not, we got a great interview in the second hour. Were you ever a member of the Kiss Army? Yeah, I was honorably <laughs> discharged in '92. Uh, wow. You know? Yeah, yeah. I served a lot of years when I was a kid. Kiss was my world, and I was really a young young yeah. boy. I mean, I was totally just immersed in it uh, when I was about maybe three, four year, years old. I had older brothers and sisters who had the Kiss albums and stuff. Uh, there were so many pictures of me when I was a child with my tongue sticking out doing the Gene Simmons thing. Uh, <laughs> I, I was such a Kiss fan when I was a kid. There I, we go. I named my first dog Ace. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, my first dog as a boy. Was, and I had, we had him for a lot of years. I named him after Ace Fraley. But then I That's was cool. kind, I was kind of confused as a kid because we had a boy cat and I named it Henrietta after Henrietta Pussycat from Mr. Rogers. So I was a bit confused about certain things. <laughs> oh, goodness. Thankfully, oh. Th- thankfully, I grew up and uh, can make the distinction between male and female. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> always a good thing to do. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that was kind of oh, good. But yeah, I was, a huge, I was a huge fan. My poor mom, we would go to, to Thief River. You know, I, I'm from Lake Bronson. We'd go to Thief River on our shopping trips. And I would beg her to buy me records. I was like five years old, you know. <laughs> At the old record barn back in the day? Well, there was the record barn, and then I remember... Uh, Pomida these, had them? Yeah, these have really good records uh, back in the day, Pomida and Kmart. And I remember these... I, I, my first few albums were the, the solo albums that Kiss put out back okay. in 78. Yeah. That they, were, they didn't sell very well, so they were basically in the cutout bin. Yeah. So that was a win-win for both me and my mom. She'd only <laughs> yeah. pay three ninety nine for these had records. Had the great value sticker on there? <laughs> Absolutely. I, <laughs> Super value, whatever. Super <laughs> and I never, until I was like in my 20s, I finally had all four of the records because I didn't get the Ace Freely. The Ace Freely one, you can never find, you had to pay full price for it. <laughs> but I had the Peter Chris one. I had the Paul Stanley one. I had the Gene Simmons one. I knew all of those songs. I knew all of those Kiss songs. I was one of those kids that would come to the neighborhood and go visit my friend's mom and entertain them by singing the best I could or whatever I could, <laughs> singing Kiss songs. So, yeah, I definitely uh, have served my time in the Kiss Army. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're going to talk with him. Hopefully, we can get a hold of him here at the bottom of the hour. And uh, like I said, Greg Fitzsimmons, second hour, had just uh, before the show started tonight, I, I did an interview with Greg. And oh, what a fantastic uh, human being. Funny guy. Great book <laughs> called Dear Mrs. Fitzsimmons uh, about his, you know, it was kind of his memoir. And it was him looking back at all the little things that all the letters he got from uh, the teachers that were yeah. sent home. His mom saved all of those, and she put he put them in the book and, and told stories about how you know he got to where he was in life and uh, how it wasn't always an easy road, but he made it. So we that's got, cool. That's yeah, cool. we got yeah, that coming that up. Sounds interesting. So how about uh, we do some music here and uh, we'll wait for uh, hopefully this next interview. Turn it up. All right, coming up, the Black Keys. Pioneer ninety point one, KSRQ Thief River Falls Grand Forks, a service of Northland Community and Technical College. And it's interview time once again on the Tuesday Night Experiment. And on the phone right now, I've got an author who's got not one but two fantastic books. Uh, one is called MTV Ruled the World, The Early Years of Music Video. And the other one, I'm really looking forward to talking about this one, talking about the life of Eric Carr, the Eric Carr story. Here's the author. I'd like to give him a proper introduction. Let's give a big welcome now to Mr. Greg Prado. Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday Night Experiment. Hey, Glenn. How's it going, man? Thanks for having me on. Oh, excellent. Thank you for uh, agreeing to come on the show. I mean, it was kind of short notice, but I truly appreciate the fact that you've taken some time out to talk about these two books you got out. That's quite ambitious here. 
Yep, you know, I actually started both those books in January of this year, and I may have set some kind of record because I had both of those books finished and ready to order by the beginning of this month. And that's really, really cool. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, information where you can find these books a little bit later, but let's talk about these books right now. And the first one I want to get into uh, is the Eric Carr story. Uh, Eric Carr, uh, if, if, to some of these people not in the know, was uh, Ki- was a great drummer for the group Kiss. He was uh, Peter Chris's uh, replacement in the group way back in the early 1980s. A guy who who put in a lot of great years through the 80s, but unfortunately uh, passed away way too young in 1991. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yeah, he he uh, joined Kiss in 1980. He uh, replaced Peter Chris, and yeah, he played throughout the whole 80s. And he was the drummer for one of Kiss's best albums, in my estimation, the album called Creatures of the Night, which came out in '82. And uh, that that was an excellent record. We were talking about that uh, uh, on the phone here before we went on the air, and yeah, because we were talking about you know, our memories of being younger and uh, falling in love with the Kiss sound, and that was one of those that albums that really stood out, at least for me and for you. Uh, great stuff with "I Love It Loud" and "War Machine." Just a couple of songs on a on a real solid record. Yeah, yeah, and it was definitely, I think, his uh, drumming that you know really really like set up that album uh, to be to be as great as it was because. For the a few years prior to that, Kiss was kind of floundering around with trying different styles of music, and the, their fan base was kind of dwindling. And it was really that Creatures album, I think, that um, got them back to where they wanted to be as kind of just a straight ahead, loud, heavy metal band. Yeah, and you know, right around seventy nine, eighty, with the, you know, after the releases of Dynasty and then Unmask, uh, they were really starting to kind of lose their identity. And like you said, uh, they were starting to uh, lose a hold of their the people who bought their records too, and and a lot of inner turmoil too, both with Peter and later on with Ace. This was kind of a group that was ready to start transitioning, and I think they they were going in in a good direction with with picking up Eric Carr. Yep. Yeah, I I think that you could pinpoint him to uh, Kiss finding its. Um focus again but again it took them like about one or two years after he joined to really to really get back on track because the first album they did with him was the uh, elder which is an album that's kind of looked at let's kind of like looked down upon by uh, a lot of kiss fans because that was a bombastic strange kind of like a concept album that had nothing to do really with kiss mm-hmm. and it, it wasn't until creatures that came out in 1982 where you know it was basically the kiss sound that you know fans were, you know, I guess, expecting and that the sound of Kiss that people first grew to love. And the music from The Elder, of course, that was uh, produced by Bob Ezrin, kind of known as one of Bob Ezrin's follies. I mean, it was it was something that was just way too conceptual for a group that was, uh, you know, straight ahead rock and roll. I mean, it was quick, hooky songs. And this was just something that was a little too cerebral. Yep. And I actually interviewed Bob for this book. And yeah, he, he uh, told me some pretty cool stories about the... Uh, sessions for that album and he also told me he basically admitted that he was pretty bad off with um but he was like you know not very focused because he was basically doing coke a lot during the sessions <laughs> the excess <laughs> so he wasn't as focused as he was say with like the uh, destroyer album which was the previous kiss album that he worked on back in 76 that was a pretty big album for them mm-hmm. and uh, you know what you know, i was reading uh looking at a few facts about uh, eric carr it's like this was the guy that really, truly uh, came up and paid his dues uh, all the way up from the mid-1960s up until the point of 1980 when he finally got hooked up with Kiss. Yeah, he was uh, basically playing a lot of bars around the Brooklyn area and also Manhattan, and he played a wide variety of music. I think he started out as kind of like a Beatles-type band he was playing in in the 60s, and throughout the 70s he played in rock bands, I think even disco bands. And then right before he joined Kiss, I think he was in kind of like a New Wave-ish type band. So yeah, he was... Um, I think throughout the 60s and 70s, and he wasn't just like a straight ahead, you know, like you know, rock drummer. He seems like he touched upon different styles of music. Now, was it true that he was uh, at the time when he uh, auditioned for Kiss? He was working uh, for his father as in the in the field of oven repair. Yes, that is true. He was uh, doing that, and he was also doing music, I guess, at night and you know, during the day. He was a stove uh, repairman. <laughs> it's just so crazy that you know he was still he still maintained a day job, but he still didn't quite let go of his dream. And uh, I think we were all as Kiss fans better for it. Right? No, definitely. You know, it's just also about being in the right place at the uh, right time. And you know, I guess just never. You know, he I think had that dream for years and years of being in a, a big band. And you know, you just have to sometimes hold on to your dreams. And you know, if you work hard, sometimes it'll all pay off. And it definitely did for him. And, and from more of my, the information that I've picked up. As far as uh, he was probably known for being one of the more fan friendly members of, of the group, uh, taking a lot of time out to answer fan mail and take time for the fans. And that's yeah. probably why he is remembered in such high regard. 
Yeah, it's true. Uh, there's uh, stories throughout the whole book that people talk about how he would always be the last band member, you know, out signing autographs. He'd be out in the freezing cold uh, signing um, autographs for bands and also just chatting with them. Yeah, so he was uh, probably the more, I guess, uh, um, you know, I mean, like Gene and Paul maybe were a little, you know, people were maybe a little scared to maybe go up to them. But Eric, I guess people, you know, were kind of, you know, cool just to go up with and just, you know, speak to him. It was maybe a little more um, approachable, you could say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he was only in there for a couple of years, and then they made the big switch over. They, they took the makeup off, which was – that was kind of what – I don't know. I was so – I was young. I was a young kid, I'll admit. I was so heartbroken the, the day that they took the makeup off. But Eric ended up having a, a character of his own, too, where he was uh, – they, they, it was a character that right away – they had to make a few tweaks, let's just say. Mm. Yeah, he was uh, – well, originally uh, he was going to be a, uh, a hawk. And mm -hmm. then he uh, and then he wound up becoming a, a fox, and the whole hawk costume is kind of uh, people think is kind of funny because he looked more like a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it was definitely better for all of us that he wound up becoming the uh, fox. <laughs> and then you know what he brought too to, to the group. I, it's just amazing that he, he really kind of uh, I don't know they, you know they were in that pattern. Like I said, you know Peter was gone, and then a few years after that, Ace was gone. But he was someone that brought more than just his drum talents. He was someone that uh, could sing as well. Yep, he could sing. He also co-wrote songs. In fact, uh, throughout this book, people even say that his talents maybe weren't really used to the most that they could have been with the band. That um, <clears throat> he, you know, probably could have wrote more songs. He could have sang more songs because he would always, you know, sing the song "Black um, Diamond" live mm -hmm. with the band. And he even sang a song on the last album that he was with Kiss. And yeah, he and he and like I said, there was probably. A song per album, he would help, uh, you know, basically write with either Paul or Gene. But yeah, he could have written, I think, and sang a lot more with Kiss throughout the uh, '80s. And what I remember too was, I mean, through the through the '80s, of course, there was the albums, you know, like "Lick It Up" and "Animalize" and and, and other things. But in 1988, I remember they put out this, the compilation "Smashes, Thrashes, and Hits," and right. he, he actually took on the vocals on a remake of Beth, yes, which was which was Peter's. Peter's baby, and that was something that really got th helped to get them into the mainstream as far as popularity went. That was a big hit for them. That was rather bold to go in and, and remake the song that was already a masterpiece. Right. Yeah, that wasn't maybe like Kiss's finest hour because uh, there really wasn't a reason to go back and do that. I, I mm -hmm. think it may have to do something with maybe uh, the rights to the song. Maybe they had to go back and take off Peter's vocals and maybe add those new vocals. Maybe that's what it had to do with because, you know, that. that first version of it was really, you know, the great version that really helped break Kiss. So I'm still to this day not too sure why they chose to do that besides maybe it just being about money. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Gene Simmons, money. Right. <laughs> you got it. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Eric uh, soldiered on through the, the non-makeup years, but as we, they moved into the decade of the 90s, that was really when his, his health started to take a turn and, and things kind of just started to go downward from there. Yeah, throughout 1991, um, yeah, he had a pretty rapid um, decline. It just seems like, uh, you know, you can be uh, totally on top of the world one minute, and then the next minute you don't know what type of uh, thing is going to you know, happen. So that just shows you that with life, you can't really take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. And just the, what he died of, it was just such a rare form of cancer. I mean, you don't really hear many stories of, of people dying from, from heart cancer. That's just yeah. what an what a unfortunate set of circumstances. Yeah, I haven't really heard of anyone else dying from heart cancer before. That is a pretty rare form of cancer from uh, what I understand. Mm -hmm. and, and keeping, you know, he passed away on November 24th, 1991. I can't believe that next year will, will be the 20th the 20th anniversary of, of losing such a, a fine, fine musician and just an over, all around from what it sounds like, a great human being. Yep, and he also died the same day that uh, Freddie died from the uh, band Queen, which is probably mm -hmm. my favorite band. And so, I mean, we wind up losing Freddie, and we also wind up losing um, Eric, too. So we lose two, you know, huge uh, rock guys basically on the same day back in 1991. Oh, I know. I loved Queen, too. There's so many great albums from their back catalog that we could mm. go on and on and talk about. And then later on, uh, you know, they, they put out the album Revenge, and that was uh, dedicated to Eric. And it also featured uh, a little thing, a little snippet at the end called Car, J Car Jam. I remember that. Right. Yeah, yeah, that was a outtake from one of the first albums he uh, did with Kiss. I think they just took one of his leftover drum tracks and for, and basically uh, built a little uh, track around that as kind of a, a tribute for him. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, you know, even after he he's he, he's passed away, he's still remembered fondly. Though I mean, he he's been admitted into the Rock Walk Hall of Fame in California. He's mm-hmm. also uh, he was also voted I see tenth place in the world's best drummer by Planet Rock Radio. So he's definitely gone. He's gone, but he's definitely not forgotten. And it, and with this book. It's definitely going to help create awareness to younger generations of, of KISS fans who have come on in the last, say, 10, 15 years, you know, with, when they put the makeup back on. You know, maybe it, it'll be kind of a good thing for curiosity seekers, young curiosity seekers, to find out that yeah, there was more to the band, too, in between, you know, the makeup on and makeup off. Yeah, see, that's the thing also with this book. It seems like a lot of the KISS books that have been written over the past 15 years, a lot of them focus on the 70s, they skip over the 80s, and they pick up back around 96, which is when the original lineup puts back on the makeup. So um, this book also, you know, focuses a lot on the uh, 1980s KISS. So, you know, like maybe, you know, if if this book helps people, uh, you know, basically get back into albums like, you know, Creatures of the Night, things like that, then great. That's a you know, really, really great thing if I could help accomplish that. Mm-hmm. And I look here, uh, just at, at your little uh, preview for this book, you uh, also were able to uh, have one of the last ever interviews with uh, Kiss's original manager, Bill LaCoyne. Yes, yeah, it was maybe just one or two months before he sadly passed away from uh, cancer also. So yeah, and he was a very, very nice, sweet guy. He was... Uh, had some had some really cool stories about Kiss's tours with Eric. The first few, you know, he he was definitely uh, telling some cool stories I haven't uh, read anywhere before. And he couldn't have been a sweeter, nicer guy. It's very sad that he passed away shortly thereafter. Um, you know, that was the guy who really uh, he really fought for that group. He, I mean, both you know, he, he stood up for them and financially too. He he took a hit just because he believed in that group way back when. And it, there wouldn't I don't think there would have been a Kiss if there wouldn't have been a Bill o, Bill of Coin there pushing and helping them achieve success, too, I mean, on, on the behind-the-scenes end of it. It's true. You have to give him a ton of credit because he was the first guy to see them play a little bar someplace or a little club and was blown away and saw, you know, the potential in that band. You know, because when he first saw them, I'm sure, you know, they weren't nearly as polished or great as what they would eventually become. And he obviously played a huge, you know, part in that. You've got to give him tons of credit for being able to realize the potential in that band. Now, uh, what other people did you get uh, a chance to interview for the book that were close to Eric? We well, interviewed Eric's sister, uh, Loretta. She was a huge uh, help in the uh, book. I also interviewed Eric's girlfriend, Carrie Stevens. She was a great help. Uh, Bruce Kulik I interviewed, the oh, guitarist from Kiss that, played, that player. played with Kiss throughout, from about 1984 through about the mid-'90s, and he was a great help. I also interviewed a lot of the producers uh, that worked on a lot of the albums that um, Eric played with Kiss. I also interviewed uh, Charlie Bignante, the drummer from the band Anthrax, Mm -hmm. and uh, I did about, I think, close to 50 or maybe even over 50 uh, phone interviews for this book. And, you know, I tried to focus on things that haven't really been talked about that much in previous Kiss books, because just as a fan, I'm always curious to read facts that aren't really, you know, well-known, so I tried to focus, you know, I tried to tell the story, but also include a lot of cool facts that aren't really out there. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. That's one of the great enticements of checking out this book, the Eric Carr story. And I see that you, you, talk, you talk, to the, a huge, talk about huge Kiss fans, Eddie Trunk. Yes. I also spoke to Eddie. He was also great. He went to, he actually attended Eric's first ever U.S. show with Kiss, which was at the Palladium in the summer of 1980. He just went there as a fan and was actually in the audience. I believe also Charlie was, too, from um, Anthrax. It just so happens that both of them went to that, to that show. Uh, excellent. Uh, the name of the book is The Eric Carr Story. Uh, you can check that out. We're going to talk about your second book before we get into the information on where these uh, people can find out more about it. Uh, and now we're going to switch gears. We're going to go to your second book. You're an ambitious cat. I'm going to give you credit where credit's due. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you got such great subject matter, too. That's the best part of it. Uh, MTV ruled the world the early years of music video, back when MTV knew how to play music. Right, and they did not play these horrible, bad reality shows. I mean, it just seems like it's all they, you know, wind up playing now, just these shows that I can't even watch more than about three seconds of. And you're looking at it here, I mean, MTV, we're talking 30 years coming up here in August of next yep, year. August, yep, August 1st, 1981 was when it first went on the air. And then, you know, back in those days, I mean, people did promo videos and stuff, but they had kind of a hard, more of a difficult time filling up, you know, with you know, actual airtime with videos. It was kind of an early primal state of, the, of music television, but it was a, definitely an evolutionary moment for music because it gave people visuals, you know, instead of just listening. Yeah, that was, I think to the best of my knowledge, the first uh, 24-hour uh, video uh, music channel because prior to that you had things like Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That was just a weekly program, and I think only about like an hour 
about like an hour long. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, really, with this channel, it really you know set set the uh, bar pretty high because now you had fans that had to you know eventually put some money into in, in, into these videos. It wasn't just well, first it was basically just bands uh, playing on a sound stage. Mm-hmm. Then about two or three years into it, then you get bands that have to start sinking a pretty good uh, chunk of change into their videos. Oh yeah, people got really more into the the art of making a video with with concepts and. Uh, I mean, you look at the videos that came out of the early years of MTV. I mean, they were like little mini films. It's true, yeah, especially stuff like Thriller. And, yeah, like that's that's basically you can pinpoint to when video budgets start skyrocketing. Like him or don't like him, Duran Duran had a lot of those videos, too, that were a part of the early years of MTV. A lot of high concepts with the girls on film, Hungry Like the Wolf, you know, things like that. Yeah, also the video for Rio. I remember that was oh, yes. a pretty popular one, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like you've got a, a lot of people that you've chatted with in this. It says uh, comprised of over 70 all-new interviews. Yep, yeah, it's true. I interviewed Stuart Copeland from the uh, police, I've, and I also interviewed members of Judas Priest, Devo, um, a little bit. I, I, I tried to speak to as many people as possible to try to cover as much ground, um, you know, regarding styles of music. I interviewed Chuck D. Mm-hmm. I interviewed Bootsy Collins. Oh, Bootsy. Uh, I interviewed uh, Bruce uh, Kulick again from Kiss. Uh-huh. I interviewed Getty Lee from Rush. Um, I interviewed Marky Ramone. And I interviewed a few of the original VJs. I interviewed Nina Blackwood and also Alan Hunter. Mm-hmm. So I tried to, and I also interviewed uh, video directors, so you get the story behind these videos, and also the people that also created the channel. So it's several different kind of uh, viewpoints you're going to be getting with this book. Yeah, so it looks like a true garden variety, and that was what MTV was, MTV was a garden variety of different acts, uh, from not just you know your basic pop bubble gum. You had metal in there. You had. Uh, you had the, the the girl the girl acts. You had the Hall and Oates, the Rick Springfields of the world. You had a whole bunch of different things to pick from, and it you know helped uh, open people's eyes and ears to the the talents of Weird Al Yankovic, for God's right. sake. Right, <laughs> exactly. Who I'd like to point out, I did speak to for the book. Yeah, oh, how, <laughs> how was that experience? Well, I have to admit that was done entirely through email. Okay, so you didn't. Get <laughs> but ju- no, but he but he uh, he was uh, he told some pretty cool stories as far as making such videos as Eat It and also Ricky and those you know cool videos they used to play. So he had some pretty cool stories that were in the book. And it's a, a great book and uh, definitely an extensive book, a read, uh, 476 pages. You're definitely not going to skimp on the information here, my friend. Yeah, I tried to cram in as much as I you know uh, possibly could because you know I know that. Uh, Times are tight for people now, so you might as well give them the most bang for the buck as possible. Absolutely. I, I can get behind that 100%. MTV Rule the World, the early years of music video, along with the Eric Carr story, can be found. Uh, where can these be found uh, as far as more additional information on these books, uh, Greg? Yes, they can go to lulu.com. That's L-U-L-U.com, and you can do a search for either my name, which is Greg Prado, that's spelled P-R-A-T-O, or you can just do a search for the titles of the books, and you'll be able to find not only the ordering info, but also you'll be able to click on the title and see previews of both these books before ordering. Now, I have to ask, uh, do you have anything cooking here uh, for 2011? Yes, I do. I'm actually working with Carmine Apiece on his oh. uh, basically his whole entire life story, and it's going to be really something, because he talks about all the great bands he played with, like Jeff Beck, Vanilla Rod Fudge. Stewart. Yeah, exactly, Vanilla Fudge. Ozzy even played with, and he also talks about his friendships with uh, Zeppelin and Kiss. So it's really going to be a great book that I think people are going to love. He was recently uh, in the area here uh, about a month or two ago in in the Grand Forks area, which is maybe an hour drive. Uh, he did a drum hit one of his drum clinics. Yes. And uh, I, I had a friend who went there and said it was just the ultimate experience being able to talk to a true living, breathing rock and roll legend. Yep, I saw him this past summer play with the Michael Shanker group, and I can tell you firsthand that he still has it. He's still a phenomenal drummer. Absolutely. You know, he's really now. There's another one who who is able to stay, have his talent, and have be able to stay in the game. I mean, he was even involved with Rod Stewart in the later part of the 1970s. He he even had a little foray into the disco scene, but it never never really deterred his uh, career path. He's still moving and making great music. Yeah, and I think he, his his basis was always you know hard rock music. He never really strayed too far from that. So that's what he always seems to uh, come back to. And you know, hence he's obviously one of the greatest hard rock heavy metal drummers of all time. He did some good stuff with Pat Travers too. Uh, yeah, that's I heard a real rock. He did a rockified version of "Do You Think I'm Sexy." I heard uh, that. I heard that. Yeah. God, <laughs> talk about a solid, solid song. Just that. I mean, taking that old disco track from '78, '79, and giving it some rock and roll stones, man. That, yeah. That's what music's all about. 
I agree. Although probably my favorite Carmine stuff is the album he did with Jeff Beck in 1973 called Beck, Bogart, oh. and Apathy. That one I think is absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah, with Tim Bogart. Yep, it's, exactly. Yeah, that one's great. great. Absolutely. Another great player in, in yep. music, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, before we go, we're going to send you on your way. Before you head out, do you have any last words uh, for the listeners here uh, up in northwestern Minnesota? I just have a happy holidays. And also, of course, if you, could, if you want to check out these two books, go to lulu.com, L-U-L-U.com, and do a search for my name, Greg Prado, or do a search for the two book titles, which is The Eric Carr Story and also MTV Ruled the World, and you'll be able to find these books. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. And keep on writing those books, man. You've got some good ones so far. May 2011, I can't wait for the uh, the Carmine book. Thanks, Glenn. I appreciate it, man. Have, have a great evening, sir. Thank you, too. All right. Here you go, gang. Another great interview. What do you think about that? Yeah, a lot of information. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's definitely a well-researched, uh, good, good guy. I mean, he's solid. That's cool. Yeah. Eric yeah. Carr, man. I like that. You know, the old MTV days, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, people forget about that because of the of those crappy reality shows or those, yep. like, really bad game shows that they try you, to shove down our throats. Once the real world came on board, man, I knew that <laughs> that was the beginning of the end. The word, the, the words hurting for certain. <laughs> Heck, I was hoping Beavis and Butthead would make a return just for something better well, than didn't, what we've didn't, didn't Beavis and Butthead make a return? Well, on, uh, I think, one of the fil- uh, films, I think, uh, of this year, they... Uh, did like a, uh, I think Jackass. I think on the Jackass the three D they did like the opening or whatever. Not the opening, but like see they had like the yeah the MTV was going to my uh, my relatives who lived in another town who had cable <laughs> and watching videos, yeah, all yeah. kinds of videos. Yeah. The early years of the Headbangers Ball. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Van, I remember watching like the old Van Halen videos, all that stuff. That was when MTV was fun because you never knew what you were going to get. Yep. It was a great grab bag of different styles. Well, just like with VH1 Classic, they need to make an MTV Classic channel or something. You know? Well, I think... Or, I don't know. Hey, they're the same company, buddy. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean, though. <laughs> make, like, make, make, make something just like so that we can go back and enjoy those great shows. Mac- you know, just go back and enjoy <laughs> an episode of Beavis and Butthead or... Or, you know, the real world or whatever. I'm know? not enjoying any of the old real worlds, man. There's <laughs> oh, too many geez. of them. Those gauntlet challenges, that, that's just dog crap. Liquid oh. television was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, that or was celebrity, for his day. Celebrity death match. Come I on. met Adam Curry a VJ. He's done some pretty good stuff with podcasting. He's, he's become a, a podcasting millionaire. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he's made, like, mucho money off that. Really? Doing podcasting, yeah. He's, he's really. Well, what does he do in interviews or what? I think is he owns he in... a company that does that, that controls podcasting, huh. gets people lined up and set up with various things, and wow, and makes a back Adam Willie. Curry, met him in Bemidji, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, at Target. Yeah, yeah oh, you should wow. have been uh, on the ground floor with him when he said, "I got an offer for you," but then he said, "Why are you taking me outside uh, to the alley?" <laughs> <laughs> That's I know. What I'm used to, I've been tainted since. Oh, boy. How about, <laughs> how about we're going to go to the top of the hour, and then we're going to get into CNN News and the second hour of the, of the Tuesday night experiment. <laughs> CNN uh, what? Sugar Sean's got a DVD review. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. yeah. And I got words with that guy. Oh, it's God. not over yet. <laughs> He's going to talk about the movie Conception. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, indeed. It's the lovely sounds of the Love Unlimited Orchestra. Snuggle up in that beautiful bed, baby. Bear wide, yeah, yeah, baby. You know, this was the group that he was. Uh, he was the orchestra leader. I've seen clips of the Love Unlimited Orchestra. He's yeah. swinging all over the place, <laughs> sweating salad dressing. <laughs> well, you hear the music. You know what that means. We got to get into another great hour of the Tuesday Night Experiment on Pioneer ninety point one FM, Radio Northland ORG. Hour number one came and went with the breeze, didn't it, boys? It yeah. sure did. Oh, we had a great guest. Yes, we did. Yeah. I mean, we learned something from Greg Prado, great author, and it was stuff that we could actually may consider, you know, reading. And I'm talking about you, Sugar Sean. <laughs> well, I think you I should read, I think you should read The Blind Dog because you made fun of him earlier. <laughs> oh yeah, we're gonna have a we're gonna oh, have a. Is, is it SmackDown time? Oh great! That's why oh, I whipped God. out the camera. Excuse me as I whip this out. You know, no pun intended there. Yeah, I'll well. take your flip camera and put it on trading post, buddy. <laughs> yep. Anything to buy, sell, or trade? Yes, we do have something. Yeah, I got. Uh... You got this flip cam from Sugar Sean Slauson collection. It's yeah. a limited edition. He autographed it for me too, so it's probably worth something. And- 
This camera hasn't seen nudity. So <laughs> like I said before, if you, if, if you want to believe that it did... Then go ahead. <laughs> well, no, you're not going to sus- make a- tell us what to believe. <laughs> now, are you one of those sickos that put it like in the, one of the chick showers or something like that? Aaron An- I think we found the one who was stalking Aaron Andrews. <laughs> they got the wrong guy. The wrong guy got oh. I guess you just never know, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you my secrets. I have a- too many. Ancient sloss and secrets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, here we are, guys. It's five after eight o'clock on a Tuesday night. Next week, we got two big guests: uh, Mary Forsberg Wyland, Scott Wyland's ex-wife, and I, I didn't mention our second guest, an author by the name of Mark Vansell. He uh, co-wrote a book with uh, professional wrestler Justin Rhodes called Crossroads: oh, yes. Gold Dust Out of the Darkness. So we're going to hear yeah. about the life of Dustin Rhodes, a second-generation wrestler. His dad, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. Ooh, Dusty Rhodes, the man of dream. I know who that cat is. You know Dusty Rhodes. Yeah, I remember you had uh, one of the Dusty Rhodes promos and one of your promos that you did. Look at this guy. Yeah. The information station over here. That. I remember Jeez. that. I remember that. Why do you build me up, Sugar Why did I die with Kings and Queens or something like that? Yeah, Look, he, he, he remembers it. He remembers <laughs> it. Ooh, let me tell you something. Nobody else can see on something with a flip camera. Ooh, look, gonna, get, gonna get my put aside. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's next week, Mark yeah. Vansell, uh in the second hour, <laughs> along with Mary Forsberg Weiland. And who knows? Maybe I might find a third guest. Hey. You never know. Hey. It'll be our last Tuesday night experiment for 2010. The 28th, you know, we're doing that in between the holidays rest up. You know, rest our minds, our bodies, and our souls. Sure. Because we have to. Time know. to get loaded on eggnog. <laughs> Looks like you already are there. I'm just uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I could drink you under the table there, sassy pants. Sassy what? pants, Lawson. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it's sassy. all going on camera here. So you, sassy you know. pants. Sassy pants, See, now, now I have proof, you know, from the YouTube audience to say that, you know, you guys are being bullied. Hey, that YouTube no, thing's getting you. My, I, I hear you might be getting uh, in some certain predicaments with your roommate about this. I, I have friends who watch your YouTube reports. Uh-huh. What's been going on with your roommate now? Well, you and that flip camera are going to get yourself homeless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I Come on, warts and all. True, let the truth you, you, set you, you free. Yeah, you, you, must, uh, you must have watched my latest video. I had a friend who watches it. I got. I don't have time to be watching those those. <laughs> Stripe film. Well, whoever <laughs> whoever it was that watched it, yes, it's, it is all true. Obviously, I, I would I would make so, this up. What, what are you going in and eating all this food out of the fridge? No, 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 no. He he just a, my roommate's more of a private guy. He he doesn't really. I don't know. He's always been that way. You know, even when I met him like four four years ago. You know, here and there at the casino, he's always been kind of a private guy. So uh, he kinda, he dropped the dropped the hammer on he you. He just here. doesn't want me filming anything, you know. At his well, we're we're living at his grandma's house. Is the story because his grandma was sick and all that. She couldn't live on her own anymore. So mm-hmm. he needed a roommate to help with costs because he couldn't afford to, uh, you know, stay in his place by himself. You so know? is grandma still there? No, no, no. So you guys have the house now. I, why is there a shallow hole in the backyard? Uh, Are you guys still sharing the same bedroom? <laughs> That's secret. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God. That means yes. yes. Uh, oh, breaking news. Yeah. Frank, Sassy Pants yeah. Lawson. Yeah. <laughs> it's something that rhymes with Como. No, I'm just kidding. No, I just, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no. TMI. Why, why would I even why? say that? Jeez, man. All the listeners now are like, what? I'm yeah. throwing a challenge flag. Uh, <laughs> No, no. Oh, man, it's all no. good. I mean, we, we got a pretty good late living arrangement, I think. So just, who has the most chicks over? All right. Yeah, well, tell the truth. I tell you what, you know, my roommate definitely loves the, uh, well, I'm not the, even going to go woman kind? It. Yeah, what I was going to talk about food here, but yeah, I think you guys would know what I'm talking about with food, what, what a person would like, you know, what they would say to a woman, you know. Yeah, I'm not going to even go into that. Can I butter your buns? What? Well, you know, like we're talking about, you know, blueberry, raspberry, strawberry. What are those? Like, what, what, what do people do to bake with them? Fruits? No, no, no. They they combine. Okay, something, enough said. Something that rhymes with tie or whatever. That's uh. He, Turnovers. He go, he, yeah, he he goes to these women's houses to get some tie. Yeah. 
That means he's getting lucky. Just say he's getting, he's getting lucky. lucky. My <laughs> God, you're just being a perv about it. Wow. Well, I, I don't know. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to say too you much. You learned some new words, and all of a geez. sudden you become the biggest serf on the planet. Yeah, I, I it, it's wanna, all coming out here now. I didn't want to say too much because I Why don't know. Why don't you scope up on some of his chicks, man? <laughs> just say, hey, I'm the slossinator. No, thank you. I'll pass. Come on. I need chicks that I know I can trust. You know. Oh, come and then I know on. That just uh, would just whisper in their ear they like that. That I know you that need a chick who wants you to be the chick? I only gave you one roofie tonight. No, no, no. <laughs> see, see the, the story is... I took two. The story is why I'm single right now is because I haven't found the right chick to settle down. And, and we need for you to find some love. They don't need that, man. They just need some loving, getting okay. hog tied at okay. the hardwood. Le- Le- ha- okay, well, oh, boy. <laughs> I I'll donate I five dollars for the room. <laughs> I thought I was gonna get in trouble for saying what I was gonna say. Yeah, probably but anyway. change. Oh, geez, so you're you looking... probably forget how to tie them. So you're looking for a a, a nice girl with yeah. nice morals. Yeah, somebody you're I in the wrong trust. town, bud. That's yeah. right. Yeah, you well... gotta head out to Mormon country for that. Yeah, you gotta get on that train. <laughs> I'm a little old school. I'm a little old fashioned. Oh no, I'm, not, I'm just just a guy who's gonna show up in a cream geez. colored suit and a bread bow tie like Pee Wee Herman. And Maybe <laughs> if that helps, you know. I'm here, I'm here to meet your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think he needs. I think he needs uh, a big old cougar. No, I think it's cougar. more caveman style. What Vicky, do you club him over the head and take him back to your you cave? Are you saying I need to go out with Vicky girl or what? I, I think Slauson needs to take a trip to Cougar Town cougar and find town. himself a nice lady, cougar a nice an old lady in the thir- mid to late thirties, early forties, possibly fifties. Oh yeah, go for the fifty. Go man. for the mature ladies. They're good. Yeah. When I think of cougar, I think of Vicky Guerrero. So I don't know. Well, you're oh. thinking you got to stop. First of all, you got to stop doing wrestling references because that ain't going to get you nowhere. <laughs> That ain't going to get you anywhere, friend. Well, I'm sorry. Now, yes. now what about the dating uh, online stuff, man? Where, where's your oh, uh, profile? And all that? Yeah. Yeah, we need to know about that. I just stuff. thought Facebook would help with that, you know? You, you add people that you might know or that we live in the area. we got to put a picture yeah. of Fabio up instead of your own picture. Yeah. You should know the rules. You know, under the relationship tab there, yeah. you got to put swinger. Swinger. Single oh. and ready to mingle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is going to give you any more points as far as the womankind, but yes, it's now time oh, for boy. our favorite uh, segment here on the uh, Tuesday Night Experiment. Yeah. You can tell I'm really, really... Fire up the DVD. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> Sugar Sean Slauson's DVD review. And uh, first of all, bef- let's give him some uh, running music. Well, ulti- here, that's better music than I had before. Jeez, tiny tune, I tell you. Yeah, we... Uh... <laughs> oh, whoop, whoop, whoops, dude, I forgot. Sorry, wrong music. Oh, wrong oh, music. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. Come on now. You know, like, like Joey Gladstone would say, cut it out. You know? I'm going to go out. <laughs> <laughs> and he has to crank it up. You know? All right, we're going. you're a male. <laughs> well, I tell you, that, that sounds more manly anyway. You know? Man. Hey. Welcome to Sugar Sean's DVD <laughs> review for Tuesday, December 14th, 2010. What do you got for us, Sugar Man? Well, this week we got Despicable Me coming out on DVD. The animated classic. Well, that will probably be a classic someday. Well, Not so right some now. of them cougars are grandparents or parents. So you're getting points there, bud. Uh, it looks like good film, and I, I think I would like to see it here, you know, whenever I get a chance. I haven't and seen ladies, it. Ladies, he's single and ready to mingle and wants to watch that movie, Despicable Me. <laughs> And uh, you might be interested in this next one, uh, 24, season 8, the final season. I haven't even watched the first few. What do you think I'm going to watch, the last yes. one? I kind of figure you'd be the type of guy who likes shows like that. You know, well, wants to watch adventure. a thing that's 24 hours long, man. It's Ugh. Jack Bauer, you know? I mean, yeah. It's uh, you know? The guy from the last one. Come Wars, on, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Flatliners, right, right, too. Right, right. Just like his career. Strike! <laughs> wow. <laughs> what do you got next? The A Team, come on, you guys oh, like the A Team remake? Yes, I I invested some time in the theater and saw that. Okay, over the well that comes wow. that, that came out today. That's it or that, not. that's redeemable. I pity both of you for watching. I mean, it's not like the classic. <laughs> Quit being a jerk. <laughs> it's not like a cla- the classic, but it's it'll, it'll have to do. So. I thought you said it's not like the what? The classic. <laughs> oh, with, with the real Mr. T. Oh, Slauson. Fingers, say to the face. <laughs> what? 
Now, what else do we got? You must have your pick of the week because it wouldn't be a Sugar Sean DVD uh, review well, without the pick of the week. Well, we got, yes, we got the uh, picks of the week. That's what I call it. Picks of the week, not pick of the week. Picks of the week. It's an ass over there. <laughs> Why not just anyway. P-I-X? P-I-X. Yeah. Okay. Picks. Anyway, the current pick oh. for for this week, anyway. For this we need to episode, get him new music. This fifth <laughs> episode of the Tuesday Night Experiment. Yeah, the guy keeps David. track. What happens when you run out of fingers? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what do you, okay, got? Okay. What do you got, buddy? The current pick is Grown Ups. Just came out this year. Have you theaters, seen Grown Ups, uh, Blind Dog? No. Oh. It, it's full of uh, the guys that we like. Oh, okay. Tell you, I'll have to check that rock in it. <laughs> I, I, I know someone that's got a copy of that. I'll have to borrow that. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it, it is a good uh, good film, and I saw it on, on demand, not on pay-per-view, but on this on, instant stream that I have. Check here. out the million there <laughs> over there. The instant stream on uh, P- uh, PlayStation 3 anyway. Well, what, are you going to pay three bucks a shot on that? I got a, a thing called a vo- voodoo. I, it's not voodoo, but it's like V U D U. You know, it's an interactive. Somebody yeah. should put a voodoo spell in on it. Internet. Uh, well, you pay like uh, you know, you just pay for program. It's almost like pay per view, except you can know, you, you search for different programs. Yeah, yeah, you got All a right. whole crap load of stuff. Even a so, Leslie Nielsen feature. So now. why do you uh, recommend Grown Ups? Now I want to hear more about this. Uh, I'm operate. Don't just drop a title and say yeah, I recommend right. it because I watched it once. <laughs> we'll get to that one later, huh? Anyway. Oh, yeah, we're not, I'm not done with you, sugar. I know, I know, I know. Anyway, I love this movie. The casting was great. All the characters were lovable, and it reminded me of how. I grew up as a kid. I thought it was definitely entertaining for people of all ages, but especially those of us that grew up in a time where there were no computers, no cell phones. How old are you, 75? <laughs> and we had to come Jeez. up with our own games to entertain us. <laughs> hey, there was a time when Milton there was... Milton Slauson. <laughs> there was a time when there was no, you know, technology. Yeah, that was a time anyway. when we had rotary dial phones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Greenbush, right? Yeah, that's right. In Greenbush. Yeah. Only in Greenbush. Now we got the magic. Gas pack. had lead in it. <laughs> well, Led Zeppelin, there you go. I don't know where that oh. falls back Anyway. <laughs> I all like lead base paint. <laughs> <laughs> Slauson, you inspire us. Uh, I'm glad somebody does, you know. <laughs> I, I begin to worry, like, oh. you know, wow. Oh, come on. Why do drugs? And Yeah, jeez. Yeah. I just come here and just get medicated. <laughs> here I figure I can do, I can kind of just be myself more or less. Anyway. All right. It's and the a, classic pick. So all, all oh, around. Oh, is it time for the classic? The Grown Ups movie, I recommend no matter what. There's there's yeah. a scene in there. Uh, that if you guys haven't seen it, it'll be a little bit of a spoiler for for some of you Uh-oh, guys who no. haven't seen Cover it. Cover your ears. Come on now. There's a scene in there where, they, where they're checking out uh, Rob Schneider's uh, daughter, anyway, and they're, they're, they don't want to make it seem obvious that they're, you know, they're I'm not watching it now. You gave it all away. Yeah. Jeez. So they do something in there where, where they, uh, they, two people look at the chick and the other two people look at, like, the tree or something like that, you know? And they do a, a thing a few times where the two people are looking at the chick and two people look at a tree. And eventually it comes out to be in two. They're all looking at the tree at the same time. So I don't know. That's probably a little bit of a spoiler for you, but uh, just uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm well, sorry. That to doesn't for work on radio. No, it doesn't. It's wow. like trying to do play by play. To me, that was the funniest Slauson, part of the movie. Just, I mean, there's a lot of funny uh, parts. Yeah, man, you just. I'll Drop the ball. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now, the classic. We got to get that one sound effect for the price is right. <laughs> no, we just got to get a fart sound effect. That's just what we need now. Anyway, like Rod Fox has on the Fox cast. Anyway. Uh, no, the there classic. we go. Other references to other shows. I love. There we go. That's what I. I'm sorry. That's what I'm, I'm talking I'm, about. I love the Fox cast. I'm sorry. Anyway, you know what, Slauson? <laughs> before we go any further, uh-huh. I was warned. I told you last week that there was a movie <laughs> that you had to watch. Yep. And I, I, I listened to all these reviews. I heard about Despicable Me, the season 55, of The Dukes of Hazard, whatever the hell you were talking about. <laughs> I didn't hear the one thing I wanted out of you, the blind dog wanted out of you, the yeah. people at home, the three listeners that love us wanted out of you. <laughs> well, I, it's two now. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. 1.5 yeah. if we're lucky. Yeah, thanks for scanning on your radio, you punk. Yeah, right. thanks. <laughs> the thing was, I, 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 offer, I, I, I was very specific when I said, Sugar Sean, could you watch a movie for me and you know, have a review ready for me? 
by next week of a film that you mentioned that was a new release, uh-huh. a little movie that starred Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, Ellen Page, directed by Christopher Nolan, a little something called Inception. I, I, it, it, have my ears gone bad, Blonde Duck? Did I hear any uh, sort of Inception? You know, he's too busy whooping it up with his roommate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, got to find a brain cell and, and find a cheap one because you ain't got no trade in. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear no insight. And that makes me just have to say this to you. Who is this bimbo? <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. The, 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 wait, you got to make time wait instead a minute. of chasing your roommate around with your spy cam. Uh, yeah, don't tell no lie because a lie can find you dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, in all in all honesty, I will tell you exactly why I was not able to be successful. Today. I have a feeling that this is not legitimate. <laughs> Were you Facebooking it up? Maybe. See, no. that's <laughs> what it is. No, no, no. There are no excuses here on the Tuesday night experiment, as I've been told many, many times before. So I will tell you exactly why. As soon as I dropped you off, last week anyway, after I dropped you off at your house, I went over to Mr. Movies. And what? I went, what a dork, huh? Mr. Movies. <laughs> yeah, local, yeah, oh, you know, another plug. Pander, there you go. The local uh, movie rental store in town. There you we got go. two of them, but that's the one I like going to. Jeez. And the movie just came out, obviously, on the day that we were talking about it. And so I wanted to go rent it because I had some money or whatever. And, Get out of here. And unfortunately, the uh, movie wasn't there to rent. And I waited. I didn't just leave or whatever after it was all said. Well, you said wait for him. Why didn't you tell the lady at the front desk, <laughs> look in the returns, see if it's in there? I you wasn't didn't even, thinking about on, that. You didn't answer. even make an oh, no effort. <laughs> Not at all, dude. How could you? And what about that gray box? You could have checked that, too. Yeah, th- I don't think that said clothes sold out. <laughs> oh, you mean the, the red box? I mean? Yeah. Gray box, blue. He's blind. Give him a chance. Don't they got that right at your grocery okay. store? They do. Yeah, then they I'm not going to tell people but, what the yeah. name of that but, store is. See, you, should you, be, you should be hooking you, up with ladies from if, that store, if man. If you went to Walmart, you know, last week or whatever, when the movie came out, they said spe- uh, specifically that Pacific's the, an ocean, bud. Exactly. Well, they, they said that the movie will not be available on Redbox or DVD Express until January because for some reason... <laughs> Some, because of all the releases that are coming out now, they can't always release the, the movie on Redbox or DVD Express yes. until you know later on. I don't know why, but that's not the rule, well, not a rule I made. You better but. check Netflix then. <laughs> yeah, you Netflix better. would have it. Or yep. you know, actually, there's a, this view do thing that I have on the PS3 has that too. It has all the new releases and whatnot updated every week, and all I gotta do is pay a certain price, and I can watch anything See, I want. That- there's but where I all your slush funds going this is, to. This is the thing. This is what I promised the listeners now. You have I'll promise. a word here. Again. Is that oh, yeah. I will I'm not going to trust his okay. word. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I, GW. I, I will, lay it on us. Yeah. <laughs> I did not sleep with that intern anyway. Uh, oh, that's Bill Clinton. I'm George sorry. Washington slept with an intern? <laughs> I will watch Inception this weekend. You know, I don't, whether it's three instant stream, DVD, Blu-ray, whatever, even through the air wirelessly. I will watch it. I'll give a proper review on it. If you don't, week. we're going to have you dress up like a pimp and go down to the commons area where the pool table's at oh and boy. say, I'm the pimp of the pool table. But what if I get beat up? We're not, we're not going to be uh, <laughs> We're going to give you a cordless mic so we get to I mean, hear the on, whole we thing. we got to be like the NWO. we got to be together. We'll, team, we'll, get the, we'll, we'll get the tie line set up. <laughs> the, band the band is back together. The band is back together. I don't. I love the reference. I don't think uh, we're going to come there and support you because Hogan, Hall, and Nash. You huh? have burned your bridge yeah. with us. No, here's what you. If you this is what you got to sing. If if you don't live up to it, this is what you got to walk up there in that dress. Here's what you got to say. I'm the king of rock. There is none higher. Sucking MCs <laughs> to call me sire. To burn my kingdom, you must use fire. I won't stop rocking till I retire. Now we rock the party and come correct. I will run right away. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you can picture me doing this, huh? Oh, yeah. Wow. But anyway, anyway. That'll I, make you watch that movie, promise. buddy. But for right now, I still got my classic pick. We haven't done that yet. And, and I want to oh. get to it because this is a special How long movie. is this movie review? Well, Play it! It wasn't supposed to be this long, but because we're the... Yes, yes. 
We're the two that I experiment. We just yes, experiment. yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Should I stop talking or no? What? Keep rocking. Okay. What do you got? Anyway, Go, the mic is this open. movie is special. I think to all three of us because I talked about it a little bit last week. For those who pay attention, uh, Far Out Man oh. is my classic pick from 1990, and why? Because. Critics, you know, uh, because uh, that was my movie and it was at my neighbor's house. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, see, you got to understand is with me, sometimes if I haven't watched, and maybe this will happen with Inception, but for me, sometimes if I watch a film like the first time I ever watched any of the Cruisers, I fell in love with it after watching it the very first time. And then I, I wanted to find the sequel, and I found it, and I fell in love with that too. Personally, I think the second one's better than the first. But anyway... With this movie, I fell in love with it. I, I will find it on DVD as well, just like you did. Probably order from Amazon.com because I know it's available and there. I hear what I did. I found it in a pawn shop. Well, okay. makes me want to get up right now. This music and just bring the party to Sean. But right see, now. critics, you know, they they yeah, hate. Yes, that's Critics really hated this film, and and you know the public didn't really like it much either. But when I well, you gotta realize it's a B movie. You know, their yeah. <laughs> their it's production probably, budget was a little. <laughs> Nil to none. Yeah, but look at all the people that were in the movie. Well, you know, Martin Mull. I mean, that guy, Martin, Martin Mull, I don't think he was too expensive. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he got a twenty dollars check afterwards, right? Yeah. That's pay, that's overpaying him. <laughs> and, but I liked it a lot. And some of the eighties references, you know, are dated because the movie was probably was filmed in eighty nine, but it was presented in nineteen ninety. Yeah. So there's a lot of eighties uh, references. Uh, I don't know. It's a classic. And it, you know, I mean, it has its good moments, and I really recommend people to see it because I fell in love with it. I know Blind Dog did, Glenn, you know, probably loved it too, you know. So it's not a blockbuster, but it's something that you know people I think should just give it a try. And forty-five minutes later, Slauson wraps up his <laughs> DVD review so for next week. Jeez. I promise, Inception. Uh, now, now, Inception. Now, what do you got planned? Because next week's going to be our last episode for the year two thousand ten. I say, let's just have that be my review next week. We don't worry about what the movies are well, coming, well, you know, coming out next week. We just go with it, and I just do. We talk about Inception because obviously it's a movie that you got that you would like well, to talk about. You're gonna have to watch it, man. Or are you gonna be heading out of that conference dressed <laughs> up as a pimp? Yeah, and then you got. We already got your Run DMC queued up. Yep. Hey, yep. I like Run DMC. I well, no, hey, no, it doesn't matter if you like it. You're gonna be performing <laughs> oh, it, boy. and we'll set it up. I'll be live down there with you. Can we do doing a re- play-by-play are coverage? We do a remote. All right. Well, you know what? You know what? It'll be semester <laughs> break, so with that may work to his advantage. What, oh. we could, what we could do is I'll go online and find some instrumentals and some lyric sheets and we're going to do some, we could do some holiday karaoke. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that uh, I, Sugar I was, Sean and I could do a duet. Oh, there you go. Uh, there you go. You'll be put singing the girl part and the Jennifer Warren's Joe Cocker 1981 hit Up Where We Belong. Why the girl part? Because this is your, <laughs> you, you lost the game. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, what do you think? You're I always really, looking I, to benefit yourself. I, I haven't really lost yet because it hasn't happened yet. But, well, you know what? You let us down. You, you let us down this week. And now, you know, with Christmas coming, do you have a now? Do you just go nuts at Christmas then with Christmas movies? Do you have any favorites? Yes, I do. I, I definitely do. Should we let him have a, a Christmas favorite, but only if he brings Inception? The yeah. Beginning? It'll cut him a little slack. Yeah, I think we. I think you know we're not going to be complete ballbusters yeah. about it because that really. I mean, that would just be destroying the whole spirit of the of the holiday season. Sure. If we, uh, you know, it's gonna we're going to have a Christmas miracle. Well, at least Sean will be bringing us a Christmas miracle by like, actually remembering to watch a movie. Well, yeah, obviously. Because yeah. we want, I want you to get out of your comfort zone because you're going to get, you're going to hang yourself with your comfort zone. <laughs> I mean, you, you come in with these movies that you're so, we've worn out. Yeah. You've worn them to, to right down sure. to the bone here. It's time that you start watching things, inspire you, get inspired by other areas that you haven't really explored before. You know, I know you're going into it rather begrudgingly, <laughs> but I think you, you have to do this for yourself. You well, really I mean, I, 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 you know, one thing you got to know with me is, you know, first of all, I am a film collector. So how about you watch the movie, come back, do the review and, and that's as fine, a but, character but, from that but, movie. Let me, let me finish what <laughs> yeah. I was going to say here. All right, let him, let him finish. I, I, I am a film collector. If you've ever seen my entire DVD Blu-ray collection, I have well over a 1,000 films. And I'm sure Jeez. in that time that I've collected all these movies since September of 2001, 
that I have watched many, many films that are many, many out films. of my league, more or less. Or stuff what that do you consider out of your league, though? Name a film that would be something out of the, the, the Sugar Sean comfort zone. Okay, like maybe uh, National Lampoon's Leonard Christmas Walter. Vacation oh. 2. That is not. That a, was horrible. I, why uh, you watch that? I don't. Why want, did I watch I it? Don't because watch I, a dog piss because stuff. I, I want something. That, I was hoping it would be just as good as this, uh, the first one. You need to understand indie films and, and films that are oh, called I, classic films. Don't you know, if you're going to tell me yeah. that you have a good knowledge of that and then drop a National <laughs> Lampoon's Christmas okay. Vacation too. You want? You I want, don't believe in you. You want <laughs> films that I've got into the indie films? There's Mean Creek. There's Igby Goes Down. There's Dangerous Lives of the Altar Boys. I mean, the list. Oh, these all Kulk here in Kulkin uh, movies? Lime Life. You're you know? watching all Kulkin sibling <laughs> movies. That doesn't count because oh, yeah, you're marking out to the Kulkins. I, they're, they're good actors. You know, yeah, but uh, that's still in your comfort zone. What are we going to do with them, dog? But the stories are, are very dog, What are we going to do with them? Man, you gotta, <laughs> you got to drift out of that zone. Okay. I could say Party Monster, but that's another Culkin Jeez. film. Anyway. Yeah, how many <laughs> more Macaulay Culkin films is he going to hey, talk I'm about? Hey, I'm just happy with the fact that there's. But still you're doing trying to films. branch out, but you're there not branching out. Films. The stories are just amazing in the films that they. Two one eight six eight three eight five eight eight. Are we wrong here to, to have Sloss and branch out? Yeah. Uh, nobody <laughs> cares. Nobody cares. Yeah, nobody the lines cares. aren't even ringing off the hook. Yeah. Because they're not working right. Because they agree. They agree with us. <laughs> They found out we had technical difficulties a couple uh, weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, you're going to make us burn with that. <laughs> no. You're going to be back. You're going to be Jeez. back down. Uh, you'll be back at Stick Cam making uh, DJ videos. I wish we still had the camera over here. I wish we could do it through Stick Cam. Man, I tell you, we could be syndicate members. Huh? I do not want to be anywhere near that. I don't want to entertain for that audience. Or blog TV or something. Oh, God. It's Michael or Bolton. It's making me ill. <laughs> Anyway, I, I do understand the points, and I, and I hope you know where I'm coming from too. But eventually, through time, when this will all Live this will all come full circle, that this two set experiment is just a blessing oh, in disguise, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, <laughs> Michael Bolton, why is your hair when so When I've been girly? wrong by sugar, so, so for Slow all the song. listeners that wa- that listen to the show, I hope, I hope that we're doing our job as as far as entertaining, anyway, and being informative. Sassy. I, I, I hope you guys like it anyway. <laughs> All right, gang. Okay. We're, we're going to play a song, and we're going to get the heck out of here. I got a Greg Fitzsimmons hey, interview. Hey, look at that. Phone's ringing. Uh, Throw them on. <laughs> <laughs> Just, there we got two. <laughs> All right. Nice. I think there's some listeners out here. <laughs> oh, gosh. Try it? Yeah, let's, let's throw them on. Kick them into gear. I swear, we'll kick them off. Hey, what's the deal, radio <laughs> person? No, they, Hello. Yep. Yeah. I got a movie for Slauson. All right, lay it on. Santa Paws. Ooh. Santa Paws. Huh? Tell us a little bit about this uh, fine feature film. I'll tell you, it's awesome because my three-year-old has been watching it like 19 times today. <laughs> Santa <laughs> Paws. <laughs> well, you know what's right reason. up Slauson's alley. Because she started puking. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> That's, That's some... another issue. Oh, so Santa Paws. Could we, Slauson, are you in with the Santa Paws? I, I, I think I know exactly what movie he's talking about because I, I, I've seen the cover for it on, on uh, DVD. Yeah, it's a, it's a dog movie, I, I believe. Christmas movie. It's, almost about, like, it's, a cute, it's a cute little puppy. I think, I think it's the perfect transition from National Lampoon into, <laughs> into something maybe a little bit out of his zone. It's, it's kind of it's gonna push this. Cuteness filter, but it's a good show. Well, you know what? I think that that actually is making some sense, uh, caller. Thanks so much for the suggestion. Yeah, no, thank you. Have a yeah, good night. Bye. Hey, it's our first caller. Can you believe? It? Absolutely. Two one eight six eight three eight five eight eight. If you have any recommendations for yeah, Slauson, let's keep it going. What, what type of holiday Could you movies? Off these phone lines. Yeah, I mean, we want to hear from you guys. Uh, but we only got a few more minutes left. Uh, we're gonna head on out into the 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 twilight, the darkness, yeah. wherever we're gonna go here, gang. I just want to say, next week we got some great interviews lined up here for the experience, the Tuesday night Ooh. experiment. Uh, Mary Forsberg Weiland, ex-wife of Scott Weiland, got a new book, Follow the Pieces. Yeah. Got that lined up. And Mark Vansell, author, co-author of Crossroads, Gold Dust, Out of the Darkness, uh, the story of Justin Rhodes. I think that's going to be some fun, fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So look at this, guys. We're going to go to this Greg Fitzsimmons interview uh, coming up here shortly. Uh, a real fun interview. Greg Fitzsimmons is probably one of the, I don't know, he's one of my top five uh, favorite comedians. The guy just has got an edge to him that just, it works for me. And I love this book, Dear Mrs. Fitzsimmons. 
and uh, he'll tell you more about the book. Any uh, parting shots here before we get on out of here? We got to go take care of business. We got TCB. Yeah. <laughs> so movie guy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gonna, gotta start calling them sassy pants Slauson. Yeah. I gotta have like come sassy up with, like, stirrup good pants. I gotta come up with like a good theme song or something like that. He's so when we do a segment. Hey, you know, once I can get in that prod room next door, I'll, I'll whoop up something for you, man. You're done, pal. You're yeah. done. Yeah. <laughs> you got I got we got the we got the dog over here. The dog is gonna work we're gonna work together on stuff. That's your worst nightmare, pal. <laughs> Yeah. I'm ready for whatever challenges lay ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, like I it, say. It's going to be awesome. You know, I'm the voodoo master of the Adobe Audition, so uh, <laughs> beware. And I've got a sick and twisted sense of humor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm just slossing. That's all. And you know what? You're a heck of a guy, man. <laughs> well, Look, you, you, know, you have kept the segment going for 32 minutes. <laughs> Jeez. Well, that's, that's because we good. have the that's magic. Good, we know that's what? infomercial. We yeah. have the material. We have the magic to keep it going together. That's why it works. We're so tragically well. so. magical. <laughs> <laughs> Magically delicious. Huh? Yeah, so next week, great interviews lined up. We're going to have Sugar Sean's uh, holiday review, and hopefully he'll be watching Inception. Inception, yes. Finally. Yes. If you know, man, you, we're totally, <laughs> we're going to do Up Where We Belong. <laughs> Yeah. Well, if if the listeners like music like that, you know, and they want to hear us sing, well, Panda maybe, alert. Maybe Panda we'll alert. do it anyway, <laughs> even after, even when I do bring it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Sean, uh, for stopping by. <laughs> yes, I appreciate welcome. it, brother. No problem. And Blind Duck. Yeah, you know my it. My radio brother from a different mother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like no other. We got Greg Fitzsimmons coming up here next, and we're going to head on out of here. Stick around. Uh, more great stuff on Pioneer 90.1 in the 9 o'clock hour. Some alt-rock du jour. And don't forget to come back next week. Uh, next week, guys, for, uh, put those headphones back on, Doug. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> next, week, next week, we got a lead-in for a couple of weeks here. Starting okay. next week, 6 o'clock hour, the return of the mayor and the mailman. Oh, boy. Yeah, I've the two times, the two time mayor. We now. are going to be messing with the local politician here. We're going to be crossing paths here with the beef. <laughs> so they're going to be in the studio once we try to hop in here? From six to, they're going to be on 6 We're going to gonna relieve them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds that's like big, a lot of fun uh, with big time. with Steve and Shell. That should be good good times. On the way, the Greg Fitzsimmons interview. Thanks for listening to Pioneer ninety point one and to the Tuesday Night Experiment. Have yourself a wonderful week. Enjoy the interview. It's next. Thanks in part to the wonderful arts and cultural legacy work of KSRQ. Ampress org is rich with great audio. This is Todd Meldy, arts and cultural heritage coordinator for Ampers. New now on Ampress org. Music from the rock trio Taffy Machine, Minneapolis's Maida, and from Northern Minnesota, Sela Ovison. In the arts section, we're featuring the creepy good illustrations of Whitney Sauer. And in history, we explore the popularity of spam. There's one place for Minnesota culture, Ampers.org. Ampers, diverse radio for Minnesota's communities. How we doing out there, blues fans? This is Little Bobby here, and I'd like to welcome you all to swing on by Little Bobby's Juke Joint each and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. right here on Radio for the Adventurous 90.1 FM. And don't be fooled by them imposters now, because I have been to the crossroads, I have slapped the devil, and I took his guitar. Can I get somebody out there to shoot that thing? Glenn Brockett with Pioneer 90.1 FM, Tuesday Night Experiment. Uh, my special guest on the phone has achieved great success as a stand-up comedian. He's an Emmy award-winning writer-producer, and he does his own thing on the radio side. And he was briefly a, a game show host, too. This guy's done it all. He's done the talk show circuit. He's very much a, a part of uh, popular culture, indeed, and he's got a great new book. I, I had a chance to read it here over the Thanksgiving holiday called Tales of Redemption, is, uh, Dear Mrs. Fitzsimmons, excuse me, Tales of Redemption from an Irish Mailbox. A yeah, fantastic read. You'd rather, definitely get to look into the life of a great comedian and a great man, and he's with us. Taking time out of his busy schedule, I do appreciate it, uh, on his never-ending book tour. Greg Fitzsimmons, welcome to the Tuesday Night Experiment. Well, it, it really is a pleasure to be on. This is, this is quality radio. I, I think that your listeners are the kind of people that actually read so I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure to be exposed to them a little bit. I mean, just just the fact that you read the book, it means a lot to me, and, and I think it might also be, um, you know, uh, an indication of what the weather is like up there. Oh, yeah, this is the perfect time of year if you're going to be releasing a book. Uh, we've already hit the deep freeze many times over, and we're barely uh, into the month of December. We can't even keep our football stadium's roof from, uh, you know, falling in. That was really wild. and. I, I'm sorry, I missed out on the conclusion. Where did they end up playing uh, last night? Uh, they ended up doing their thing at uh, Detroit Stadium, uh, Ford Field. 
Wow. And who won? Uh, well, let's just say uh, it wasn't the Vikings. What is it with the Vikings? They got a great team. Well, the you know, I, I really felt so excited for you guys. Like last year, I got really into the whole Forest thing, and I used to watch every game with my son. And he was—he's wild about that uh, that defensive tackle, um, uh, Jared Allen. Oh yes. And it just seems like you guys are such a fun team to watch, but. At, they're just not winning the game. It's the curse. I mean, we've had four Super Bowl appearances in the 70s. We jobbed out every time, and then it seems like we get to the dance. We get to the championship game, and we just peter out. Yeah, it's a shame. I've always found Minnesota to be an exciting football team. I mean, going going back to when you know Chris Carter was there with uh, on one end of the field, and then um, uh, what's his name on New England now on the other side, the wide receiver. Oh yeah, we had uh, Randy. It was the good one. Randy yeah, Moss Randy was Moss when he was Randy Moss when he was stable. You know, Chris Carter was a stabilizing figure in that guy's life, and it seemed when Chris retired, you know, the ego. Something just happened with Randy. I mean, the talent has always been there. It's just yeah. the, the, the getting your you know head out of your ass and uh, realizing that you got to contribute to the team, not you know make yourself the the egotistical frontman. Yeah, it really seemed like a case of too much money. You know, I just think if I got that much money. Do not expect me to be as funny as I am right now. <laughs> well, yeah, it's just like you have too much money, and then you have, you know, you can buy all the things you want, then you have nothing really positive, you know, negative to think about. You got, well, I don't want to leave the house today. I don't have to. Mo money, mo problem. Exactly. Let's talk a little bit about the book because this is uh, what you came to, uh, you know, promote here on the program. And the, the reaction, first of all, it's been really good from what I've been listening to your program on Sirius XM uh, on Monday nights. It seems like this uh, book is really starting to gain legs here, uh, and it's been out uh, well over a month now. Yeah, it's, it's actually been picking up each week, which is always a great sign because normally it's just the opposite. And uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the there have been great reviews and a lot of good word of mouth. And it's, um, I think it's something that everybody can relate to in the sense that the big theme is about rebellion and how all of us in some way uh, have to give it back to authority. It's like part of the American credo. Absolutely. And then that's kind of intensified in my life because I'm Bronx Irish and Catholic, and (laughs) there's just so many other elements that made me always have to do the opposite of what I was told. And so the hook with the book is that these uh, my mother saved Every bad letter, <laughs> disciplinary report that was sent home. That blows my mind. On top of clipping uh, pieces from the newspaper when I'd been arrested for fighting or drinking, and almost like she was proud of it. <laughs> and then as I got, in, got into adulthood, I've always saved the letters as well. So it's almost like, you know, with memoirs, sometimes you kind of wonder, is this all true? Yeah. And I feel like with my book, it's like, no, I'm showing the work. Here's, here's the documents that show that this actually happened. And you know the thing is, I, I I read lots of biographies and stuff, and I can definitely uh, agree with what you were saying about if you believe if you know if it, you don't know if it's true or not. Like like I, I read read your book, and then I read Rick Springfield's book. God, I don't know why. You know his big problems were <laughs> I've had too much sex. Oh my God, I can't stop having sex. These women love me, and I'm in my fifties, going into my sixties. Poor, poor, pitiful me. The demon is right around the corner, and it wants me to have more sex. Yeah. Oh, poor boy. Yeah, it's hard. It's really hard to pull for that character. And then I read uh, Keith Richards' book, uh, Life. Yeah, I mean, well, the... no, I actually listened to it. I downloaded it as, a, as an audio book, uh-huh. and which is kind of cool because it was Keith Richards reading uh, parts of it, and then it was um, uh, who was the actor? Was from? it Johnny Depp that did that? Johnny Depp. Yeah, which was really cool. And and you know, and and it, it's it's like. Somehow we're supposed to believe that a guy who's been on heroin for 30 years, by his own admission, Mm -hmm. has this acute sense of memory about every detail of his life. I've been reading that too. I'm in like the, I'm about the uh, 65 pages in, and he has just such vivid memories of when he was a kid and all this stuff. Like you were a smackhead for how many years, pal? Yeah, and it seems like. you know, as you get further in, you'll start to see he's talking about these three-day binges and, like, snippets of conversation that happen in the middle of it. And it's like, look, it's a great read. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend it. But it, it is funny with memoirs of how, how loose things can get. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I've read Vince Neal's book. I, I read everything. Him. I, what I got out of Vince Neal's book was uh, they don't like me unless they need me. 
I'm yeah. just their singer. It's like, okay, well, you know, that does pay a lot of money. Yeah, I guess it's, you know, th- there there seems to be um, a, a narrative that most memoirs have, and you'll see it even in the subtitles of books, including mine, which is there has to be redemption. There has to be mm-hmm. change. There has to be an admission that something was horribly wrong with you. Mm-hmm. And, and that somehow... Uh, through sheer will or through bottoming out, there there was some kind of a, a vision of how things should be. But in mine, I, I, you know, I, there is no resolution. You know, it's about how I've gone to therapy. I quit drinking 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. I've stopped getting into street fights as of two years ago. and <laughs> But now I'm getting letters sent home from my kids' schools about them, and they're exactly the same as the ones that I got as a kid. It's really come full circle then for you in your life as far as these, these notes that your, you know, your mom saved, now you're getting them now from your, chi- your children too. Well, it's just bad DNA. I don't know how much <laughs> I can do to help them. Oh, the thing is, when I was reading this, I was like starting to remember, you know, the things that I did as a kid. And I was just like, man, I think I better call my mom and tell her, you know, how much I appreciated her because I was getting those letters too at a young age. I had these old women teachers when I was in second and third grade. They put me right under the microscope, you know, I suppose because it was something better to talk about than their time uh, that they attended the Seneca Falls Convention. But I mean, it's still like. I just related so much to this and how I got used to get these progress reports every week saying, well, he got three marks this week instead of six that he needed because he was fighting or he did this. And yeah. just reading your thing is just I'm like, man, I'm like, like a kindred spirit or something. Well, yeah, and it's true. It's, now that I look back, I have an appreciation for these teachers. And at the time, they feel like the enemy, mm-hmm. obviously, because you're getting into trouble because of them. And they seem like really mean people. Yeah. And then you look back and you go, oh, my God, this teacher literally saved my life. You know, this one creative writing teacher that I had in high school where I had a D average for four years straight, it wrote on one of my creative writing papers, you know, this is really funny. Have you considered doing this for a living? Mm-hmm. And a light went off and, and it stayed on for the rest of my life. Somebody believed I could do this. And... It's all I needed. You know, I needed that one teacher to look beyond the bad behavior and getting there late and being high and saying, you know, there's something in there. And, uh, you know, and I've kept in touch with that teacher over the years. You know, and it's just a part of, you know, growing up, too. And, uh, you, you know, it's not you're not going to have this picture perfect life of being a goodie. You know, some of us are just weren't meant to be goody goodies. We were meant to learn from our mistakes. You know, and the thing I was reading about you is how you, you broke away from some of the friends that you grew up with. And some of those friends, uh, unfortunately, didn't have the, the, the type of, uh, you know, positive you know conclusion that your life has led on. And it talks a lot about how, um, I mean, I had a lot of friends that died. I mean, we live... Mm-hmm a very dangerous life and the difference between them and me surviving is you know really random you know i easily could have been the guy who died in a in a car accident uh you know or got into a mm-hmm. fight and, and got knocked into a coma and the fact that i didn't i have an appreciation for and i i treasure and i and i honor i think some of my friends by trying to take advantage of that as much as I can and live, live a full life and not, not make those kind of stupid mistakes anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, reading right away into your book, uh, the, the, the funny story, you came out swinging in this book, uh, the story that you wrote about having to uh, perform stand-up at a prom gig in the Midwest, that had me rolling right away. That locked me right in. I wanted to finish that book right after reading that. Jeez, it, how did you end up getting into a gig like that? And just in Indiana, was it? It was, um, yeah, I was in, I used to do a lot of college shows in the Midwest. My, um, my college agent is located in Chicago and they, and I'd fly out of New York city to, uh, like Minneapolis. I rent a car Mm -hmm. and then I would do, I would do shows in Minneapolis then Nebraska, then the Dakotas. And I would be out on the road for two weeks straight in a rent a car staying at motel sixes. And Mm -hmm. just literally I would have a, a noontime show in a cafeteria at one school and then a show that night in, a, in another city that might be three, four hours away. And then I might have a day and a half with nothing to do in a farm town. Mm-hmm. And eventually my agent would just throw anything on the tour. And he said, there's a high school that wants a comedian for their prom. And it's in the Bible Belt. 
and they are real strict, but do you want to, do you think you can handle it? And I go, of course, because <laughs> it was that or sit alone in a, in a hotel for a night. That's a gig. So, so I show up in the entire class. I had just gotten off the bus after going to church. And a church before starts, a prom. Yeah, church. God, you're kidding me. I mean, I'm, I grew, yeah. I'm up in the Midwest here, and that, that's still, that, ah, oh, just could. <laughs> it was this small town, and every guy looked the same. You know, they had the mm-hmm. crew cuts, and. Uh, the women all looked like virgins, and they just read me the riot act before I went on about what not to say. And it just pushed every button in me. And I went out there, and I just did the show that I wanted to do. The kids loved it. Standing ovation at the end. And then the uh, and then I get this letter sent to my agent, and that that really was the genesis of the book. That's when that's when I because I got really upset by the letter. I was like. You know, screw this guy. I'm a comedian. And that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And those kids are old enough to hear the mm-hmm. truth. And so, it, so I started reading the letter on stage just to kind of show people how crazy. And I started getting huge response on it. I ended up reading it on a Comedy Central special, mm-hmm. and I realized this is my life. This sums up my life. And so, um, my mother started showing me all these letter that she, letters that she'd saved over the years, and. I did a one-man show, and it really did. It started with that one letter, and then it tracked my life and my relationship to my father, who, you know, was an alcoholic and was a big kind of physical guy, and, mm-hmm. and sort of what I went through and, and how that set up my authority problem at a young age. And from reading it, too, you know, getting these letters sent to you, uh, your parents uh, from, from various teachers through the years, their reaction was kind of a, a mix where you didn't know whether they were going to laugh or uh, you know, give you the belt or something. Yeah, it was, it was very Irish, you know. Mm-hmm. For the Irish, if it's a good story, then uh, everybody can laugh about it, and there's this huge release, and it kind of reaffirms who we are as a people, that we don't play by those rules. And at the same time, if a letter came in that showed a disrespect uh, that went beyond that, then um, and and my dad would happen to be in a in a foul mood, then it became a very different reaction. So the anticipation of you know seeing that the letter's on the dinner table mm-hmm. and it's going to be read and you don't know which way it's going to go, uh, that when when they did laugh, it was just joyous because not only were you having a laugh, you were not having a beating. And, you know, reading about that thing, your father, I mean, was a big time radio guy in the city of New York, too. I mean, we're talking that, that kind of casted a, a shadow as well. I mean, Bob Fitzsimmons, definitely an icon in New York radio. Yeah, it made me grow up uh, feeling even more so that my dad, who was six foot two and had a huge personality, which would have been enough to make him uh, daunting to me. On top of it, we, you know, we walked down the street and people are yelling out, hey, Fitz. And we're at the Giants game. Hey, Fitz. And we're at the Mets game. And hey, Fitz. And signing autographs. And, and so he became even bigger to me and that much more uh, intimidating in a way of, of how small I felt. Mm-hmm. And so I really loved my dad. Uh, you know, I still love my dad. He died young. And uh, he taught me most of the things I know about life. And um, he taught me how to enjoy life and attack life and... Um, I think that going into show business was never seen to me. I, I never saw it as, oh, I'm going to let my parents down, or I don't know if I can, can you make a living doing this? Because I saw my dad do it, and, I, and he supported me in it. So it was a really mixed, complex relationship that I had with him. And, uh, and I, I, even though he's been gone a long time, I you know, still think about him every day. Mm-hmm. And you've kind of carried on uh, an, a, a somewhat of a radio tradition now with your own radio shows, uh, both uh, with the Sirius XM and your podcast. So you're, you're, you're getting a name for yourself in radio, albeit a different venue than the regular terrestrial brand. Yeah, and it's funny because, you, you know, as a kid, I, I really had no visions of going into the family business. It was always like, you know, you don't want to do what your dad did. You want to have your own identity. And so... I went off to do my thing, which was stand-up, and uh, now that I've got two kids, I kind of, Howard Stern offered me a job doing a show on his channel, and I jumped at it just, just for fun, really, mm-hmm. and uh, I enjoyed it so much, I started doing a podcast two days a week, and 
Uh, it's called Fitz Dog Radio, and it's become one of the most downloaded podcasts on iTunes. And so it just kind of gained momentum. And now the idea of doing radio is it's so appealing to me because I don't have to go on the road with two kids. And the freedom is great. And, uh, uh, you know, if I ever had an opportunity to do it full time, I would, I would absolutely do that. I would give up a lot of other <laughs> things that I do to just do radio. And you've got your own little setup there uh, by your house? Or where do you have this uh, your studio set up then? Well, yeah, I built a studio behind my house, and it's all set up. You know, I have guests come over, and I interview them right there. And uh, I, I also have this, you know, pretty good equipment, so I can go around L.A. and go, you know, go like yesterday. I went to Ray Romano, and I interviewed him. And mm-hmm. uh, sometimes I'll have people call in. And so it's all, it's all really easy now with technology. I can, I can get things done from the road. Like I'll be in Connecticut this weekend working at a – at a casino, and, and I'll have my equipment with me, and I'll do a podcast right from there, and I, I, I upload it to iTunes, and it's, and it's on iTunes, and 50,000 people have downloaded it to 12 hours later. And I really like, uh, I listened to your program uh, last night on uh, Sirius Satellite. You had a great guest uh, that I, initially I was kind of hesitant, but I ended up really thoroughly enjoying your chat with uh, Fred Durst. Yeah, I think a lot of people think of Limp Biscuit and they think, wow, that was a, that was a time in my life that uh, I can't relate to even, you know, that kind of music. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but underneath, underneath it, you know, I met him at a party. I was at Tom Arnold had a Christmas party. And I met uh, Fred there, and we talked for like an hour. And, and he told me about how he's uh, directing films now. And uh, I just found him to be a very truthful person. And to me, that's the only thing I look for in a guest. I, I need somebody that's going to come on and not deflect questions and be able to get into it and admit to things. And uh, he was all of those things. And, and, you know, I had Dane Cook on not long ago, and mm-hmm. it's the same thing. I think he got a, he got a bad reputation for being, uh, I don't know, a little bit too pop mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, other, other kind of rumors flying around. And, and the point is I brought him on my show, and it was a human being that I was talking to that was very honest. Mm-hmm. And that always makes for a good radio show. It doesn't matter if you're famous or not. It's just... It takes a certain uh, spirit of okay, I'm on this show and I'm gonna I'm gonna give it everything. Speaking of good radio, uh, over the, the, the past uh, few months back, when you were working on your book, uh, you're back and forth with Howard Stern over the the forward of uh, Dear Mrs. Fitzsimmons: Tales of Redemption from an Irish Mailbox. I mean, unintentional or not, that made for some pretty good radio, almost dramatic radio at times, just getting Howard to fully commit to getting this forward. It was kind of a lot of back and forth between you guys until it finally, you know, finally got done. Yeah, it was real radio theater. It was a a premise that was created out of the fact that I wrote him a note asking him if he would do me the honor of writing a, a forward to the book. And, uh, you know, ending with, hey, there's no pressure, no expectation, Mm -hmm. I know you're busy. And then he read the note on the air. And it had a lot of personal stuff in it about what he he means to me and that he's a mentor. And uh, it was kind of embarrassing. And then he said, well, I'll write it, but I don't want to. And, And we were off and running. And that became the premise for two months. He would bring it up on the air at least once a week about how he can't bring himself to write it because... He'd rather play video chess. He'd rather have sex with his wife. He'd, he'd rather do anything than sit and write my forward. <laughs> and it just kept going and go. Every time I thought, well, he can't talk about it anymore. Two more weeks of talking about it. And it was like suddenly the book's done. It's at the printer. There's two pages being held that are blank at the beginning of the book. And, and he still hasn't done it. <laughs> and then he suddenly says, I'm not doing it. I just oh. decided I'm not doing it. And now, meanwhile, the, the cover is already stamped with Forward by Howard Stern. Mm-hmm. All the bookstores have bought a certain number of books with the understanding that there's a forward from Howard Stern. And now we're stuck with this thing. And so the last day or so got really ugly with, like, you know, 4 a.m. phone calls where I'm live on the air. And, uh, and so in the end, I, I didn't let him off the hook. And he wrote it, and it was actually really, really funny and totally him. And uh, I guess it was all worth it because it was, it was a lot of good exposure. Mm-hmm. It was very funny stuff. And uh, what do you think now? Uh, Howard's re-up for five more years. Does this mean more Greg Fitzsimmons show on Monday? It looks like it. It's, uh. been, um, it's been three, three and a half years that I've been doing the show. 
And um, again, I'd love to do more. Uh, right now, I've got this one hour, and I do. I, I throw everything I can into it. I book a lot of big guests to come on. Um, you know, I've had just in the last couple of months, I had Zach Galifianakis, Natalie Maines from the Dixie Chicks. I had um, Pete Yorn. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just Solid. Ray Romano. Just people that. You know, because I'm in L.A. and because I've been um, in the comedy world for so long, just people that I can kind of call in favors with. So I think it's good for his show because there's no other Los Angeles-based show on the network. So it, it, it allows me to bring in guests that wouldn't necessarily be on the show on the East Coast just because they, they may not be there. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, before we go, would you have any, uh, any additional comments you'd like to make uh, for our listeners up here in northwestern Minnesota? Yeah, you know what? I, I, I love that part of the country. I, as I said, I did a lot of those college gigs up there. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I have, I have really good memories of it. And, and in the wintertime, it was, God, it was bleak. And I, and I can see why you guys read a lot. And thank God you do. So, um, you know, if you're, if, you're cold, if you're cold this winter, pop in that uh, Fitz Dog radio. You can download it at my website, which is fitzdog.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, check out the book and... I hope you like it, and uh, I, I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, and I appreciate you took the time. Uh, the book is called Dear Mrs. Fitzsimmons, Tales of Redemption from an Irish Mailbox. Thanks uh, again to the, the one and only Greg Fitzsimmons. All right, have a good one. Yep, take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Pioneer 90.1, KSRQ, Thief River Falls, Grand Forks, a service of Northland Community and Technical College.